Ted, no. Okay. Um, and let me ask you um, again, when he talks about his hand being unfeeling, is he referring to this physically or psychologically at this point? In terms of if he discussed it with you. When he discussed it with me, he said it felt different, but he was discussing how psychologically it felt numb and strange to him. Did Alex have some pet names or references he would call you besides boy? Yes. Um, what were those? His pet names for me mostly were his lamb. He would call me his son, as in S-U-N. And lamb, son, and his goon at times. All right, let me talk to you specifically about lamb. Yes. What did he tell you he meant by his lamb? As we were intimate, he would tell me, and as he would call me his lamb, he would use it in the holy sacrificial way as the Lamb of Christ or the Lamb of God. He would tell me I was his holy sacrifice. I was his lamb. Did that have a specific reference, his lamb, in relationship to what's shown on the cover of the Kierkegaard book? Did he say that to you? Yes, we discussed this deeply. Um, the sacrifice that or what is shown on the book is the story of Abraham and his struggle as he was called to sacrifice his son, which he had an ultimate love for. And he would discuss to me the beauty and everything that was in the lines and in between the lines for him for that novel, as he would read it to me during intercourse. And was there a specific comparison between the lamb that yes. Abraham substitutes for his son and calling you the lamb? Yes. Can you explain what that is? As he would say to me that Abraham, the sacrifice of the son is a sacrifice to God, the holiness of it. And he considered me his lamb, his holy sacrifice, and all of the love in that and the sacrifice of not wanting to give that up. He also used the word son, S-U-N. Was yes. he referring to anything specific when he told you he was, you were his son? Yes, he had a pet name for... I know in, this is embarrassing. So. It, it, this is embarrassing for me. Um, it's in reference to my v vagina, it, the sun, the blaze, the warmth. He would often talk about how my intimate area was his sun, S-U-N. Now, during this time, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you up now to, um, first of all, are there many journal phrases where Alex would refer to love and do what you will? Yes. Did you take the journals and count up what you thought, how many times that he would actually refer to that phrase in his journals? Yes. How many times did you count? Roughly, it was the high 20s into the 30s. It's, it's deeply woven into the journals. Was that phrase also deeply woven into your relationship? Yes. It seemed like instead of your typical morning text message, it would be a text of love and do as you will, or he would somehow bring it into almost every conversation we would have intimately, just normal conversation at the coffee shop, at home. It was, it was always a part of every day. Tabby. Tabby. I'm gonna ask you, um, about some specific sexual acts between you and Alex, all right? All right. As your sexual relationship progressed into January and February, yes. did the sexual acts between you and Alex undergo a change from what they had been? Yes. 
Can you please tell us what that was? Well, from what I said before, the more vanilla, it turned into a, what at times could be considered a BDSM relationship. And what does BDSM mean? BDSM is bind, dominance, and it can be submissive or sadomasochist. It's, it depends on what sector you're in, if it's submissive, dominant, or sadomasochism. Okay, I'm going to ask you this with respect to Alex, okay? Yes. Have you heard, in respect to BDSM, what a safe word is? Yes. What is a safe word? In a BDSM relationship, a safe word is essentially, it's one of the most important parts of the relationship I consider. It's when in an act when something is getting too much for you or one of the partners or the submissive. And a safe word is something that individual can say when it's just too much and it's time to stop. In sexuality, first of all, with regard to Alex, what role did you play, the dominant or the submissive? I took the role of submissive. And in that role, did Alex and you have a safe word? I suggested it, but we did not agree, and we did not have a safe word, no. Why didn't you agree? What did Alex tell you with respect to ha not having a safe word? He didn't prefer a safe word. He, f he told me in our relationship that it didn't, he didn't want that, essentially. It didn't play into kind of what he wanted to get out of the relationship. And I'm going to ask you about some specific sexual acts. First of all, I'm going to ask you about wax, or what's called wax play. Wax play is when you use a candle, like a candle or a wax-like substance, and you drip or drain it onto your partner, the submissive. Before you referred to prone, and we only discussed prone in terms of you being face down, was there another aspect to what was called prone that eventually developed in your sexual relationship with Alex? What eventually developed with this prone position is the desire for the submissive in this role to be in a what is commonly called a chokehold or to to appear to be unconscious. Did, was that something he did with you? Yes. Um, let me ask you, how is it that without a safe word, in your mind, did this connect at all with what Alex used to say to you about your flaws and vulnerability? Yes. Can you please explain that to us? With Without a... In an act like this, or in an asexual act, without a safe word, it, it is hard for me as an individual to be vulnerable. I was uncomfortable with the idea of no safe word, and he demanded from me to be vulnerable in these times, and that was hard for me. In addition to the wax and the chokehold thing you described, was there ever a time back in your relationship in January or February where Alex used a knife when having sex with you? Yes. He had cut a pair of my pants that I had one day. It never went as far to touch or graze my skin. He just ripped through some holes that were already on my pants and I just, I threw them away after that. What was your reaction to these things? The wax, the chokehold, the knife, that one occasion. Um, what was your reaction to these? My reaction, I was very supportive of his dominance at first. I wanted him to feel like he can express himself. And I was also exploring. With the wax, it, it was different and it was a bit strange for me at first, but that it was fine. I found I had issues with the prone position and being in a chokehold from behind. I started to not enjoy that. It was really just not what I wanted, and I had voiced my opinion a few times. It was 
just, it wasn't with my alignment. The time he had cut my pants, he ripped through some holes already and he cut them. And I was a bit frustrated at the sense that, oh great, I have to throw some pants away now. But it made me a bit uncomfortable because it was so sudden and so new. Let me just take you back to something you said, because I want to follow up. You said you voiced your opinion? Yes. What did you say to him when you voiced your opinion? When I voiced my opinion to him, I said to him, essentially, in this prone position or in this position, that I was sore, that at times it was uncomfortable and it felt as if it was a bit bruising and constricting for me. It caused anxiety. When you told him that you didn't like it, yes. how did he respond to you? Well, it was quite crude how he responded, but he would tell me that it wasn't fair that I had finished and he wasn't going to get his chance then. So you're telling him you don't like this, to not do it. He's saying it's unfair, I didn't get to finish. What would happen as a you know, either during, after, before those conversations? During the conversation, he would express how he was, he thought it was unfair he didn't get to finish because he spent so much time for me. And I, I would just essentially not completely shut down, but just say, all right, and just let, let it go, just let it happen. So you would let him complete what he yes, wanted to do? Yes, yes even when you didn't feel like it? Yes. I'm showing you from Exhibit 697 an essay called Between Love and Obligation. Yes. What's the date on that? December 3rd, 2017. Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. This essay, does it begin with him talking about love and do as you will? Yes. And as this essay continues, does he talk about love and do as you will? I'm not going to have you read it, but is there a continued discussion about what it means? Yes. Does he specifically um, mention... There is love and do as you will. Don't worry about self-control. Be excessive if you want to. There is nothing you ought to do. Anything goes. Yes. Did he discuss that with you? Yes. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that, because there's the original love and do as you will, but when he says it, it was his way of it saying, this is what I mean when I say this to you. This is what I mean when I say love and do as you will. So in other words, in your intimate relationship with Alex, would he express a divergence from the philosophical love as you do with will to the personal love and do as you will? Yes. Sustained leading. Okay, what did he express about how love and do as you will meant to him personally in your relationship? What he told me in our relationship is that there is going to be times when he's going to take control he's going if he there's going to be times when he's demanding certain things and love and do as you will as he would say is the reason why he's able to do this because he will do as he will it it was his way of saying I'm going to do this and love and do as you will he would say I'm showing you the sentence that's near the very end of this essay on the page that begins with the, mer the word merely. Yes. Can you please read that sentence? Merely doing as one will sexually makes consent irrelevant, but merely letting another do as they will does the same. All right. This issue about consent being irrelevant by doing as he would. Yes. Were you aware of this sentence in his journals before the sexual acts became, in January and February, things you were uncomfortable with? Yes, it was a conversation we had in detail. And how did you feel about this line about consent being irrelevant? Well, as I was reading this essay and we are discussing, yet again, love and do as you will, 
I pointed it out and I told him that I felt completely the opposite of this. I come from a point of when consent is everything, like consent, 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 each step of the way. And this for me was a first red flag. Essay. Yes. Called Resolution, written on January 1st, 2108. Yes, I'm familiar. Okay. And is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. All right. Can you read that essay? I need to be I need to be more selfish. My relationships have failed because I couldn't ask for what I wanted or needed. I love people who are hurting, but I am too. To find anything that will last, I need to find a way to be selfish. Oddly, I need to find resol resoluteness <laughs> resoluteness in this resolution. Selfishness needs to find a place in my values. So as he started to take and do what he wanted sexually. Yes. And you were protesting. Yes. Did you think about this essay where he had said this at all? Yes, I had. I, I thought about it often. And I'm going to show you one last essay now. And um, I think we're going to be done with the essays. Okay. That point. Um, now, I'm showing you, again, another essay. What's the title of this essay? The title of this essay is Faith in Flesh, February 2nd, 2018. And again, is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. And I'm going to ask you about a specific paragraph that's kind of in the middle of this essay. Can you read this paragraph? Yes. Next, the other may demand that I not die. They may demand that I not commit self-sacrifice. This may be because they enjoy my self-mutilation or, be beca or because they refuse to carry the guilty of my guilty flesh. In both cases, my duty is to feed is complicated. For to give purely is suicide. For to give purely is suicide, go ahead. Violence against another to provide for this demanding okay, other. I'm sorry, I think Did you I miss a sentence? What, one minute. For to give purely to suicide <laughs> can, involve, <laughs> can involve a cessation of violence, but it is the obligation to not die oddly, I must commit violence against another to provide for this demanding other. This forces me to murder. In order to provide, I am doing it either way. This is demanding, this demanding other has taken my redeeming suicide from me and doomed me to torturous guilty. Okay. So when you saw that Alex had written about murder in his journal. Did this stand out to you in any way? Yes, this essay did stand out to me. Okay, I'll ask you more about that later. I'm going to go back to talking to you about um, Jason. All right. All right. Yes. Um, this relationship's developing with Alex. Yes. And... As this is going on, what's going on with you and Jason? As our relationship with Alex and I developed, the rift between me and Jason and the distance furthered. We, it seemed as if we were more roommates and just living together than we were girlfriend and boyfriend anymore. What were you thinking about doing with respect to your relationship with Jason? I was thinking about leaving, ending it, breaking up. Now, you heard Jenna Van Zandt testify before? Yes. And I believe 
that I'm showing you what's been marked previously as exhibit number 405 and entered in evidence. Is this a copy of texts that went between you and Jenna Van Zant? Yes. Um, and what did you say to Jenna Van Zant in that text? Would you like me to read it exactly? Um, or you can summarize it or read it either way. In summary, I was expressing that I needed more boundaries, that I was feeling mistreated, and I, the relationship was unhealthy, there was no communication, miscommunications, and that I, I, I need to talk to him about these things and I might need to leave. Well, in the beginning, you say, I'm realizing I'm finally brave enough to talk to Jason. Yes. To talk. Did you also refer in this to breaking up with him? Yes. Yes. And did you talk about how other people were telling you about your relationship with Jason? Yes, a lot of my friendships I had at Racy's, I would tell them examples and things that were going on between me and Jason. And my friends at the time, they were telling me that this is unhealthy and damaging and you need to get out of this. Um, did you talk about him specifically name calling you? Yes, he had called me names. In this, I said specifically, he called me retard, retarded, one of the most offensive things to me. Okay. Now, on this day, on February 5th, was this right before you, in fact, did break up with Jason? I believe so, yes. I'm just going to briefly diverge. All right into something else. Um, well, let me just say this. Eventually, did you also break up with Alex? Yes. Did you break up with the two of them in the same month? Yes. So which breakup was first? Jason. And how long after breaking up with Jason, did approximately how long, I know you don't have a calendar, did you break up with Alex? Not long after, a few weeks or so, maybe a month. During this time, did you, did you also spend some time with a fellow named John Hansen? Yes, I had. How did you know him? He was my friend through Jason. And being your friend through Jason, did you have any interest in John Hansen? Yes, at the time I did have some interest in John Hansen. Would the word crush express that, or what word would you use? I had developed a crush, yes. When Jason went out of town, well, so you were spending some time with John Hansen. Um, did you know of a friendship between John Hansen and Alex as well? I was well aware of their friendship, yes. And Phyllis, did they discuss philosophies as far as you knew? Yes, they discussed philosophy all of the time. Um, do you know if specifically they discussed a philosophy called nihilism? Yes. Section relevance. Overruled. Go ahead. Did they? Okay, go ahead. Yes, that was a topic all three of us had discussed together all the time. And when discussing nihilism, what did Alex Woodworth say that it meant to him? What Alex Woodworth expressed to me about nihilism is that it's a kind of take all. It's a going against the norms of society, and it's a very... In a lot of ways, it's kind of a pe pessimistic nihilism. It's a very different view of life than I had at the time. What about John? Did he express similar things to you? Objection, yeah. relevance. I'm going to sustain that. Uh, it, again, it's what's in Ms. McCandless, it's in her mind. Uh, so, sustain on that. Now, when Jason went out of town, um, John Hansen and you, had you done some drawings, paintings, or anything like that? Yes, we had been hanging out quite a bit, doing art together. When Jason went out of town, did something happen with you and John Hansen? Yes. What happened? What happened between me and John is that he bought some wine for us, and I had gone over to his house to talk about what's going on between me and Jason, and... Alex and what's really going on and 
I hadn't really eaten anything that day and I started to drink a lot of wine. And I had ultimately become severely drunk to the point of throwing up and blacking out a few times. Did you, so is it fair for me to say when you say blacking out a few times, do you mean that you were in and out of consciousness? Yes. Does it also mean that you have a hard time recovering some of what happened that evening? Yes. Is there something specific sexually, though, that you do recall about that evening? Yes. What is that? Specifically, I remember it being dark and w w waking up, and I could clearly feel that I was in a sexual act, that I some, someone was having sex with me. Did you know who that person was? Yes, it was John. The next day... Did John, um, so let me ask you this, this sexual act, did you resist him at all? No, I just let it happen. The next day, uh, in the morning, what happened? In the morning, he told me to go to his son's room and wait until he got up so that his roommate wouldn't suspect that I was in his bed. And... Did you eventually go back home? Yes, we, he drove me back to my apartment. When he drove you back to your apartment, did he come in? Yes, he did. And um, what happened once you were inside the apartment? Once we were inside the apartment, he had said that he had to go to the bathroom. So I went upstairs to change out of my clothes from the night before, and he came into my room with me. And <sighs> this is hard. Um, he just started undoing his belt and said that I looked great and uh, proceeded to ask me and lead me to perform sexual acts with him. And again, did you resist him at all? No. Did you tell him, no, I don't want to do this? I didn't say much of anything, so no, I did not. Now, after that incident with John Hansen, was it shortly after that that you left Jason's apartment and broke up with Jason? Yes. Where did you move when you left his apartment? I moved to my mother's. Who helped you move? <coughs> Alex helped me move. Had you previously introduced Alex to your family, or at least to your mother? A few times he met my family, yes, at races. And had Alex also uh, come over to the office that your mom worked in one time? Yes, I invited him to come help peel some wallpaper from the office. When Alex came over to your families, did even after helping you move back home, was he invited back another occasion? Yes. And who did he spend time with on that occasion? On that occasion, he spent time with me and my mother. Anybody else? Yes. Who? My sister and my dad, my stepdad. And what's your stepdad's name? James Gunnelson. Okay. Um, after you moved out, were you still seeing Jason at all? Well, first of all, when you moved out, was Jason in town or out of town? He was out of town. And um, were you still seeing him at all? Was he still your boyfriend? He wasn't my boyfriend, no. But we were still texting. Things were confusing between us. During this period... How did Jason come to know about John Hansen? Or did he come to know is, I guess, what I should say? He did, yes. How, do you know how he came to know about it? I do know. He had wanted to spend some time with me in Eau Claire, so he rented a hotel room for us. And after a night together, I woke up to him going through my phone. And there had been some text messages. What, just I just want to back up there a second. When you say your phone, was it actually a phone or a different device? No, I never use a real phone. I always use an iPod, which I've been using for a while when I'm connected to Wi-Fi. So I'm pretty disconnected otherwise. Okay. And um, in fact, there was a phone found in your car on yes. March, after March 22nd when the police found that. Was that phone functional? Um, I... 
don't know because I never paid the bill. I got it for just a little while for work and then I just stopped using it altogether. So it ran out of minutes, of course, so no, it was not functional. Okay, let me get back to this whole issue about Jason going through your iPod. Um, what did ha what happened when he went through your iPod? When he had gone through my iPod, there was a few text messages that were flirtatious between me and John that I had not deleted. Jason woke me up and he had screenshotted my text messages. He was pretty angry and he even broke my iPod in this anger. And when he broke your iPod during this anger, did he do anything else to you? Yes, during this conversation we were having, well, argument, he threw my iPod to the floor after reading these text messages to me. He pushed me down on the bed and told me I couldn't leave until this was resolved. What, did Jason place a phone call to anyone? Yes, he had called John. During this conversation, were you able to hear the entire conversation? I was right with him the entire time. Were you asked to talk to John during this conversation? Yes. Who asked you to do that? Jason asked me to speak with John. And did uh, Jason say something to John about having sex with you? Yes, he asked him if I, he had had sex with me, and John responded that he had not. Um, and why did... Do you know why Jason made you talk to John on the phone? He made me speak with John on the phone that he so he could li so that he could listen to our conversation and see if he would change his story. And during that conversation, <coughs> did John acknowledge that he had had sex with you? Yes. And had you acknowledged that to Jason? Yes. When you talked to Jason about this, yes. John having sex with you. Um, yes. Did you express at all that you thought it was a rape, or did you ever use that word? No. <coughs> did you ever use the word? Do you want me to have some water? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... Okay, why don't we just hang on just a second? Yeah. Of course. <coughs> okay. What's that? Okay, go ahead. Did you use the word assault when you talked to Jason? It was not a word I had used, no. Um, after you, he had talked to John on the phone, did he take you over to Josh Trankler's? Yes, he did take me to Josh Trankler's after this. Okay, who's Josh Trankler? He's a friend of ours, a friend we share, yes. Um, what happened, I just wanna make sure everybody's what happened when Jason took you over to Josh Trankler's? Well, after I had told him roughly what had happened the night between me and John, Jason got just full of rage. He was pacing and he told me he was going to do something to John, that he was gonna kill John, that we needed to go somewhere to talk to somebody with a level head. So he, ta he had taken me to Josh's house. When he got to Josh's, was Jason acting like he had a level head? No. What was he doing? Jason went upstairs with Josh and he would pace downstairs and he was just pacing all over the house. He was yelling with, at Josh essentially and he just, he, he would, he was very hot-headed at that time. He was very angry. When you were downstairs, could you hear him upstairs? Yes. And as a result of all of the screaming and yelling that yes. Jason was doing, to your knowledge, did Josh, how did you know that, or did you know how Josh Trankler responded? Yes, I do. He called the police because he was concerned as what Jason might do to John. When the police got there, did they ask to speak to you? Yes, they did. What did you tell them? The police were directed to me by Jason and Josh to talk to them, and I didn't really want to talk in this place where everybody was angry and hot-headed, so they asked me if I would like to go back to the station to talk, and I said yes. Now, you've been in court and you heard the tape of you talking to Officer Vang. Yes. Was everything you said on that tape true? Yes. You also heard testimony about you talking to Detective Proc. Yes. And 
essentially, in so many words, did you tell Detective Proc essentially the same things that you told Officer Vang about the sex with you and John? Yes. Did you ever use the word assault or rape when you were talking with Detective Vang or Detective Proc? No. Did somebody bring up the word assault or, or something similar to you? Yes. Who was that who brought that up and defined what you told them or informed you that this is an assault? Objection relevance. Sustained. I would like to approach. All right. Objection is sustained. Actually, Judge, I withdraw the question. Okay. After hearing from Mr. DeFranco. So, um... Um, did you inform Detective Proc when you were meeting with him that you had been flirting with John? Yes, I told him about that. Okay. And did uh, Detective Proc and Officer Fang give you some literature after you met with them? Yes. Well, after I met with Vang, there were some individuals that they provided me with a folder full of pamphlets to to get help and counsel during a tough time like this. Did you go to counseling? Yes, I did. All right. Now, I'm going to move from talking about that to talking about um, the period of this happening. First of all, before this happened, where Jason was looking at your iPod, yes. did you break off with Alex before that occurred? Yes. Uh, was Do you remember time-wise how recent it was before Jason looked at your iPod? It was briefly before, before approximately. Like a day or two, is that what you mean? Yeah, briefly? yes. Okay. And um, so I'm going to ask you some questions now about that period between All right. um, you moving back home, breaking off with Jason, then breaking off with Alex. First of all, yes. why did you break off with Alex? Let me ask you that first. I broke off with Alex because during this time there was so much going on and he wanted my love and vulnerability and it at that time I wasn't ready for a relationship. I felt there was just so much going on. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to work on my previous relationship yet. I wasn't ready. And during this period were you saying, what were you doing generally with your life? Who are you, you said you were living with your mother, I believe, yes. right? And living with your mother, were you working? Or what, yes, what was I was. going on with your life? So I moved back home with my mom and I applied to a school that I graduated from. And I started soon after working as a paraprofessional in the kindergarten through fourth grade special education room. And besides working, were you talking much with your, uh, Jason during that time? Yes, I was. What were your feelings or your thoughts about Jason during this time in March? During this time, I lots of feelings of love from the love we had when we first started a relationship, memories from when we first started. Just being away from him made me miss him, and I was feeling again a lot of that love. Were you texting about that? All of the time, yes. Was Jason reciprocating your texts? Yes. Did there, uh, in the middle of March, did you go to Eau Claire and spend any time with Jason? Yes. Just tell us about that briefly. I went and I spent some time with Jason. We had started sleeping with each other again and talking about possibly maybe getting counseling thinking about all the things we had said to each other in the past, just seeing if maybe this really needed to work out because of how much we did love each other. And when you said you started sleeping with him, um, yes. where did you spend some time, a couple of nights with him or anything in Eau Claire? Yes, I spent a couple of nights with him. We got a few hotel rooms. We didn't really want to be at the apartment. Okay. After spending a couple of nights with Jason, do, do you recall that what time that was? Was it like the date? Do you have any memory of what the exact dates were? I have no memory of the exact dates, no. Okay. Um, 
did you um, return after spending a couple of nights to Jason's to your mother's house? I did, yes. And what happened when you got back to your mom's? Well, um, my mom wasn't supportive of me continuing or exploring the idea of rekindling the relationship I had with Jason. And me being her do me being her child and she was my mom, we got into an argument. Of course, I I knew what I wanted and I was she disagreed, so I moved out after that. Okay. Um let me ask you then about going um so did your mom feel the same way about Alex that she felt about Jason in terms of what she expressed to you? She had some mixed feelings about Alex as well. And when you broke up with Alex, um, how did you break up with him? I regretfully broke up with him through text. Why did you do it through text? It was, I did it through text because I did it in a rushed way. I just wanted to just be done with all of this drama. Okay. We'll come back to talking about you and Alex later, but I'm going to ask you, after your mother was upset with you because yes. you were saying Jason and asked you to leave, where did you go? I went to my dad's. Um, and is that your father, Joe Shane Carlin, who we saw in court? Yes. All right. What is your father's main employment? He's a correctional officer. And besides his correctional officer primary, yes, does he have a do-it-yourself or secondary business that he owns? He has a tree-cutting business that I helped name when I was about five. Did you uh, work with him at that tree-cutting business? All of the time, yes. And when you worked with him, um, did you use knives at all? It was a part of every day. When he, um, in addition to knives and the tree-cutting service, did your father, I'm going to call him your father, he's your adoptive father. Yes, he's my father, he's okay. my dad. Um, did he give you or let you have other knives in your car? Yes, he seemed to always give me one or want me to have one in different places. There's been discussion here about the knife that, um, that you used or the knife that was in your car that the police yes. found by the side of the road, the knife that was involved in the knife fight with you and Alex. And yes. Was that, and how did you get that knife? Objection, Your Honor, to Mr. Stain, argumentative. Okay, the knife we're talking about, how yes. did you get that knife? That knife was a knife that my dad had given me. He's, he always likes to make sure I'm prepared for every situation. So various EMT knives he would give to me to break glass. It has seatbelt cutters. He just wants me to be prepared. It had been in and out of the house. He has a few of them, yes. And that particular knife, did you put it in your car on the morning of March 22nd? No. Do you know when you put it in your car? No, it was in and out always. Okay. Um, what would your dad, specifically with the use of knives, what would your father tell you about that? Objection. Hearsay. Sustain. A judge, it goes to her say to mine, not the truth of the matter asserted. Let, let me rephrase right. the question. Maybe okay. it'll be more clear. Did your father ever say anything to you about having a knife in your car specifically um, for defending yourself? Objection. Hearsay. Well, it's not offered for the truth. No. The matter is sort of just for what is in her state of mind, so Correct. I'll overrule the objection. Okay. What? Yes. Okay. What did he tell you, or what do you recall him telling you? What I recall my dad telling me, he told me many times, and he would always tell me, when you're in a situation with an individual or if someone's attacking you, that you need to do anything and everything you can to get away, to defend yourself. And he would tell me about... You can use knives, you can scratch, you can kick, you can fight. Were you aware that there were firearms in his house? Well aware. Did you know where they were located? Always, yes. He made me aware of this. Uh, were you able to have access to them? Yes. Did you learn how to use firearms when you were young? Of course. He made sure of that. Did you go hunting with your father? I never hunted, but I've gone hunting many times. Now, did you 
take a firearm with you when you left your father's house on the morning of March 22nd? Absolutely not. Why not? All I was doing that day was going for some errands. There was no need for a weapon or a firearm or anything of that sense. Was one of those errands that you were going to do on March 22nd, in your mind, was one of the things you wanted to do to talk to Alex? Yes. And um, so did you want to bring a gun with you to talk to Alex? Absolutely not. Were you afraid of Alex? No. All right. I'm going to ask you some specific uh, uh, communication that you had received on the evening of March 21st. Uh, were you sent a picture on Instagram by Jason? Yes, I was. Um, and that's a picture we've seen that's an evidence of the bathroom wall? Yes, it after, is. After you received that picture, uh, what did you do? Well, I wasn't happy about it. Did you have then a voice conversation with Jason yes, I in did addition call him. to texting? Yep. And when you saw that picture, did you have some thoughts in your mind about who had written your phone number and, um, you know, F me on the yes. bathroom wall? I had some ideas. I thought it was either a barista or maybe some of the kitchen boys, as they're called. What, what do you mean by kitchen boys? Kitchen boys, well, that's what they call the workers who work in the kitchen side of Racy Dell Lanes, which is called the nucleus. Just a bunch of guys. Like cooks, chefs? Cooks, chefs. Did you, in your mind, did you think Alex had written it? No. Um, it Your Honor, was, then I'm going to object to this whole line of questioning as not being relevant. Well, the, the state brought this in for some reason. I think her state of mind about yeah, it. I'm going to overwrite. Thank you. Um, were you planning to mention it to Alex? Yes, I was. What was your intent with telling Alex about this? My intent with telling Alex about this was just to ask him, like, how do you think they got my number? It kind of sucks that this is going on. There's a lot of drama. Do you know who might be doing it? So I could ask them that this isn't right. Can you stop, please? All right. Before, in, in the period of time where you were at home. Yes. In March, were you writing any journals? Yes, I was. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 365. Yes. And what's the title of that journal? This journal is Ezra McCandless, Silence Broken. I'm also showing you what's been marked as 366. Is there a title on that journal? There's no title, but it's called Journal 2. Okay. Over what period of time were you writing these two journals? It was a period of a couple of weeks. I had been visiting someone for counseling. And they told me maybe to write Objection, down. Objection, hearsay. Sustained. Why were you writing the journals? To express how I felt oh, about it's... everything. And were you doing it specifically because you were trying to have this be part of the therapeutic process for you? Yes. All right. So there's been some testimony about these journals being edited on March 21st. Yes. Did you open the journals on March 21st? Yes. Over the period of weeks, I had finished it a couple weeks before, but as a writer, you always open it to correct misspellings, alignment of paragraphs. Every time I open it, it adds that it's been seen or edited. Was this journal in a format called Google Docs? Yes. And in Google Docs, every time you open a document, does it update the date? <coughs> it does, yes. Okay. Um, did you, uh, you've reviewed these journals, right? Of course, yes. And were you going to send them to a friend named Julia Post? Yes, I had sent them to her already. And what was the purpose of doing that? The reason why I spent time with a few weeks before and why I had sent them to her is she's She's great with grammar and she's great with words. So she was helping me out. She was kind of my consult for cleaning it up. Okay, I'm gonna put this now on the Elmo. We're not gonna read everything, but I'm just gonna ask you in this journal what you're talking about and why, just in summary form. All right. So just to summarize, this part of the journal, when you're talking about moving uh, back, it was the past summer and you had moved, had you, 
been where had you been before the summer you moved back with your parents? The summer before I moved back with my parents was spent in Marinette, Wisconsin, and that's where I was starting my first year of secondary school. Okay. So after your first year of so secondary school for you does that mean are you referring to college? Yes. Okay. Just some people call secondary school high school, so I just that's wanted true. to clarify college. that. Okay. And so after your first year of college, um, are you telling us you'd gone back home? Yes, I am. All right. Now, when you went back home, did you uh, did you then write in your journal about your relationship with uh, Jason Mangle? Yes, I did. Um, you used this sentence, months have passed between us and love had grown. It's an ancient love so powerful, it often scared both of us. I became sick and had the suspicion of what it could be. So what do you mean when you're writing in those passages? What I mean by, as I said in there, an ancient love so powerful. Many times between me and Jason, our own philosophical discussions, we talk about past loves, being old spirit. We, cons we both consider ourselves, even though I'm young, to be very, very old spirits. So, is that that expression people use sometimes? Oh, he or she's an old soul. Yeah, all the time. Okay. All the time. He would describe me as his old soul. So, as saying that this love, this passion, this love, it was just we felt so much love and so much in common with each other right away that that's just how I express that. In the essay did you go on to talk about your abortion yes I had um, and did you express how the abortion impacted your relationship with Jason Mango I expressed how it impacted us greatly yes Okay. and did you then write in this journal about after you said in this journal that you became I think the word is a husk of a woman Yes. And what did you mean by that? What I meant by that is after the operation and after everything that had happened, I felt just so, I felt like a part of myself had been taken away. I felt hollow inside. You then start talking about two individuals invading your empty mind. Yes. Dragging you down a rabbit hole, told what ideas to follow, masks you should wear. Can you explain what you meant when you wrote about that? Yes, so during this incredible, vulnerable time when I had terminated my pregnancy, my the two dominant voices I'm speaking of here are friends, were friends, Alex and John Hansen. I was talking about in this how during my vulnerable state, I was being told kind of how to feel, how to get over things, what to do, just kind of how to I describe it as a mask, just kind of how to move past this in ways they thought might help or what I should do, they thought. So this is your feelings then, but as you were going through this, you, you talked about developing feelings of love for Alex. Yes. So in here you're expressing it completely differently. Yes. Why the difference? The difference is coming out of the relationship. I, I don't want you to look at this. I just okay. want you to talk about how you felt. All right. So coming out of the relationship, I in that relationship, I felt all of this love and this warmth and listening to him and him telling me what I should do and what I should think, essentially. In that moment, all I felt was that love. I was only, that's all I was, all I could notice. And then being completely removed from a relationship and from that relationship, I noticed all of the red flags or things that really didn't fit right with me and that it's opposite now because I'm expressing what I had, I had ignored because right. of love. Let me ask you this. Okay? Yes. Um, in this, it, yes. without putting on the screen, you, you wrote, I was an object even called a fetish. Can and, that it horrified you to be described as a fetish. Can you tell me what you mean by that? <laughs> what I meant by that in this essay, or journal as you can call it, was that the person I had loved at that time were, uh, in instead of just being me and wanting to be seen as me, they started to express how I was a fetish to them, how, how I identified, how I looked, what they wanted from me, 
instead of essentially being Ezra McCandless, the person, I was just the want, the fetish, the sexual aspects. Is that how you felt at that time in your relationship with Alex? Yes. And um, you talk about what happened with John and vomiting and yes. fears. Um, and then you also then talked to that you had turned to your other friend for advice and concerns. Yes. And what do you mean by that, you would turn to your other friend? What were you writing about? I had talked about in there turning to my other friend being Alex about what had happened between me and John. And you said that when you turned to Alex, um, you wrote, to, you said, guilt towards our friendship only to once again for it to turn to his desires of making me the boy he wanted. What did you mean by that? When what had happened between me and John had happened, I quickly, shortly after I went to go talk to Alex, I told him my fears about what had happened, the confusion, the kind of the betrayal aspect of it. And during that time when I went over to his house to see him, he just kind of told me, well, I can make you forget it. You can sleep with me. We can spend some time together. Let me make you forget. What you wrote in your journal after that was, quote, it was painful, and I often said stop. Yes. I can't. And then you wrote bit, but I think you mean but. But he would then yes. change the position and proceed to say I'm fine and just too sensitive. Earlier you talked about your sex with Alex talking about your fine. Yes. That he should finish. Is that what you're referring to in this journal? Yes. And I was referring to, yes, the sensitive, feeling bruised. I was referring to that, yes. And... At the end of the journal, you have a section called What is Next? Yes. If, what are you talking about in the What is Next section? Do you need me to put it up on the screen for you to refresh your memory? Sure. Okay. Okay, so just, again, I don't want you to read the whole thing, but... I'm refreshed, yes. Okay, so let me ask you this. When you're, when you're talking about this in this section, about what is next, what are you talking about in this journal? What I'm talking about in this journal, in, there were sections of this, in this journal going through my relationship, my loves I had had, and in this what is next is I was writing about, like... What am I going to do next? What can I become? I felt that my opportunities are endless. I can keep pursuing the career I want. Just I, very inspired by a conversation I had with my father and how I can take a course of action for myself. I can become who I am. When you said I betrayed the one I love in many ways and felt nothing but regret and pain knowing how far I lost myself, you put that yes. in there. Yes, I had. And were you talking about how you were going to change that, or what were you talking about? When I was talking about that, not that I was going to change the betrayal and the feelings of guilt, is that just acknowledging that this had happened. I'm not going to hide from what I had done. And I acknowledge the fact that my partner at that time was deeply hurt, and I can recognize that and acknowledge it. You ended this with writing, I cannot hurt myself anymore. I cannot hurt the ones I love. Yes. I can become Ezra McCandless again. I am worth it. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is there was so much going on in the past months. There was drama. There was loss and there was pain and there was love. And I've stepped back and I recognize all of it. I recognize that I am worth it as a person. I can be what I want to be. I can do what I want to do as in career wise, as an artist, I can just express myself and embrace that it's, it's, it's time for a change. Let me ask one thing in this journal, and I'm trying to find the line. Yes. Um, and I think Mr. You, oh. 
Okay. The part about what is next, you talked about being inspired by your dad. Did you write the whole paragraph, what is next, or was that just a feeling you're having? I'm a little confused. The whole paragraph at the end, what is next? Did I, you, yes, I wrote it, yes. I, I know you wrote it, but did yes. you write that whole paragraph that night? Or no, did you write it no, early? it was, it kind of corroborated the fact that I can do this. I am worth it. He helps me embrace that feeling more with our talks. Okay. And you also, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but you also yes. wrote what's called Journal 2. Yes. What's Journal 2, uh, what are you writing about in Journal 2? In Journal 2, it was mostly, it was more of a reflection of the guilt, the pain, the relationship issues I had had. It was also... It was another. It was kind of disconnecting myself from another in a relationship and looking at that, reflecting on that, and how I felt about that at that time. It, is that journal too much more specific to your relationship with Alex Woodward? Yes. Okay. And um, again, um, you end that with saying, "I do not discount my part." in the abuse, I do not feel innocent. Are you referring also with Jason when you say I do not feel innocent? Who are you referring to? I'm referring to all of it, all of it. To Jason, to all of my relationships at the time. Okay. My mother, so my father. Are you feeling d d that you're taking responsibility or? Yes, very much so. I is that a theme in therapy? What was your, you yes. know, that? Objection. Sustain. Um, were you wanting during this period of time to take responsibility for your own actions? Very much so. I I didn't I wasn't running from anything I've ever done. I wasn't I was taking responsibility for my actions and even if I didn't want to look at all of the ugly parts, I was going to do it because I have a responsibility to grow as a person. And that's a big step of that. You ended that essay with, I know I can be human, I know I can be free, I know I can love, I know I can only strive to never do this again. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is to be more aware, to be more conscious of my relationships. What I meant by that is I can be human, I can express myself, I'm not hiding and I'm not... Essentially, that was mostly about cheating and leaving someone for certain reasons. Now, after you, um, did you send those journals to Jason Mangle? Yes. Um, did you want to show your journals to Alex and John? Yes. Objection, hearsay, or I'm sorry, meeting. I'm sorry, what? Was it's there reading. okay besides sustain? Let me just rephrase the question. Okay. Besides giving the journals to uh, Jason and Julia Post, did you want to go show these journals to anybody in person? Yes, I wanted to discuss these in person and talk about it and show them them. Yes. Who did you want to show these journals in person to? Alex and John. They're integral parts of the journals, so I thought they should be shown. And. Um, of those two people, yes, who was more important for you to do that with? Alex. Did you bring physical copies, or were you just going to look it out on your phone, or what were you going to do? I didn't bring any physical copies. I have it always loaded up on my notes and in my Google, so there's really, if I want to read it to him or if I want to look at it, I can just pull it up. So on the morning of March 22nd, did you come into town? Yes, I did. And when you came into town? Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you about coming into town that day. All right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been previously admitted to evidence as Exhibit 424. Can you see this from where you are? Yes, I can see this. Okay. Um, this is uh, called the Timeline of Events on March 22nd. Do you remember yes. this? Yes, I do remember right. this. So when you first came into town, where did you go um, first when you drove into town? First when I drove into town, I went over to Alex's to see if he was even home yet. Or what happened when home. you got there? I knocked on the door and nobody answered at all. 
So, so when nobody answered, what did you do? Just go to Racy's, continue on my day. Um, when you left there, I think you're saying you went to Racy's. What did you yes. do when you got to Racy's? When I got to Racy's, I got my favorite drink, a mocha. Okay. And I noticed my friend Max. Before noticing Max, was Jason Mangle at Racy's? Yes, he was out front smoking his usual cigarette, so we just kind of exchanged some quick words. It was brief. Okay. You go in. You've seen the tape. You're going in. Yes, I have. Okay. Then you walk up to the, what do you call that? The counter? Is the bar. The bar? The coffee bar? The coffee bar. Okay, not a bar bar. No. Okay. Um, so you walked up to the coffee bar, and I think yes. you were just saying you talked to Max. Yes. What was your conversation with about Max? Well, after I got my coffee with Max, I was just like, hey, I've got the art, the painting I'd like to give you in my car. I'm in town today doing some errands. I was wondering if you'd want to do the art swap now. Okay. So had you put the painting in your car, when, when you say you were in town to do errands, was that one of the errands that you were hoping to do on that day? Yes. So apparently, was it your original plan? First you'll talk to Alex, and then you'll give the, then you'll talk to Max and explain yes. the paintings? Yes. Section leading. Uh, that's just me. Okay, I'll rephrase that. What was your plan when you were coming in for the order in which you were planning to do things on that day? Yes, so that day, first I was going to, well, I gathered my things, okay. and I put my painting in the car, and I was going to go talk to Alex and get that done for the day, and then I was going to go to Racy's and see if I could find Max and do the paint swap, and then I was going to see, before I had to go home to watch my my little brother now, I was going to switch over. I had a change of a mail address that needed to be handled. Okay. So after, did you, after seeing Max, what did you do? After seeing Max, he was pretty excited that I had the painting for him. And he had this painting he described to me as a cosmic goat that I would really like. So we exchanged those paintings. Um, and after, during this period, there's a picture of your car at Racy's and then yes. returning to Racy's. So what did yes. you do after seeing Max? After seeing Max? Or after going to Max's house. Oh, after going to Max's painting. house, we talked for a little bit. He went inside, grabbed his paintings. We came back to Racy's and I dropped him off, gave him a hug. Did you tell Max what your plan was? Yes. After you were seeing him? What yes. Did, what did you tell him? I told him that I wanted to go over to Alex's house. There was a lot I have to talk about with everybody, and I, I definitely wanted to talk to him today. All right. So, um, let me just ask, why did you only have a brief exchange that morning with Jason when you saw him? When I saw him, he seemed kind of occupied. I thought he was busy. All right. Was, it, was that unusual to you? No. Okay. We've had many times where we just pass. When you left Racy's, yes. after seeing, I, I think that at least they have your return to Racy's here at 11.13, right? Did you yeah. stay at Racy's very long after you dropped Max off again? No, I think I went to the bathroom and got ready to go. And after using the bathroom, where did you go? To Alex's. At the same route as before? Do you know? Do you know the route you took? I take a couple routes to get to Alex's. It's probably the one I take usually, just right over. Okay. And when you got to Alex's house, what did you do? When I got to Alex's house, I parked my car in the driveway and I left it running and I grabbed my, well, his heating pad and such and I went up to the door and I knocked on it. All right, let me ask you about the heating pad. Why did you have a heating pad with you? I had a heating pad because I had some really awful menstrual cramps and I was like complaining about it one day and he's like, oh, here's a heating pad I never use. Why don't you use it? But specifically, maybe my question wasn't clear. Why on that day did you have the heating pad in the car with you and why did you take yes. it to Alex's house? That's what I'm so ask. when talking to an ex, it's, it can always be awkward. It was my way of kind of having an icebreaker, a, bruf, a buffer to start a conversation. Were you planning to do something with the heating pad? Give it back to him, yes. Were you also planning to retrieve anything from his house? Yes, I was hoping that he still had a few clothing items and possibly I left a cup, uh, an antique cup there that I really liked. Um, 
I think last week it was mentioned that the Little Prince, had he ever given you a book, The Little Prince? He had given me two Little Princes. What was the difference between the two of them? The difference between the two Little Princes is that one was a kind of, I call it a children's style book. So it was in English and it was wide and large. And the other Little Prince he had given to me was a smaller version and it was in French. Had you brought one of those copies previously back to Racy's? Yes, I had. Do you remember which one it was? It was the large child's version, as I would call it. So you um, you go to Alex's house, you ring the bell. Are you afraid of him? No. What happens after you ring the bell? I knock on the door and... Oh, you knocked on the door, not ring the bell? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No bell. Okay. Um... I knock on the door and I hear some kind of shuffling around and I noticed his his roommate kind of comes down the stairs and pops his head in and then he's gone. When you say his roommate, was this anyone you had ever met before? We hadn't met, but I had seen him plenty of times. It was Dave. Had you ever really talked to him though? No. All right, so he popped his head and then what did he do after popping his head? That kind of, see? well, I seen that he just kind of seemed like he went and got Alex, and then he just kind of scurried off somewhere. Was uh, Dave Strading dressed when he came to the door? No. <laughs> okay. Um, you said you thought he got Alex. How did? Why did you think that? Because Alex came down shortly after. And when Alex came down to the door, what happened? Alex looked a little surprised to see me, and I said hi, and I was like, I have the heating pad and stuff for you. And he took it and he was like, do you want to talk? And it was a quick exchange of words before we went upstairs. When you were going to see Alex, yes. what are the things that you wanted to do or accomplish in having a conversation with him? What I wanted to accomplish in having a conversation with Alex is that I didn't have any, I abruptly broke off our relationship, which I felt was unfair. I thought it was immature, the fact I did it over text first off. I just wanted to make sure he was okay and how he felt and I just felt that he had the right to express himself fully about how he felt our relationship was going, how things ended. Just wanted to check in with him. Um, did you also want to talk to him at all about but John been, or anything like that? Yes, I wanted to, I had I knew that because he was close friends with John that I wanted to ask him about um, I, it was an apology, actually. I was like, I'm sorry if you have to talk to any investigators. I know this situation is uncomfortable. And I wanted to share to him about my counseling and writing I've been doing since it. So with all of these purposes in mind, you go up, yes. you go inside with Alex. Where do you and Alex go? We go to our usual spot, which is his bedroom. And I sit on his bed and he's kind of milling about his room. And then he sits next to me and we start talking. Are you afraid of him at this time? No. What were you and Alex talking about? Well, first I said my apology about, I'm sorry that if you're uncomfortable because of there's, you might have to talk to an investigator, there's things going on. I also mentioned, I seen a photo with my name and with not my name, but my number and some crude words. Do you have any ideas who might be doing this? Are you referring to the Racy's bathroom? Hall? Yes, I'm referring to the Racy's bathroom. Hall. Okay, and so you tell him those things. Yes. And how does the conversation proceed from there? The conversation proceeded from there. I was a bit tearful because I was expressing to him about how upset I was about what had happened and how I had been seeing some help about this and how I was expressing myself, kind of writing, and I was telling him roughly how I felt. Had you brought a knife into the room? No. There was some testimony that uh, I think Jason Mangle said he noticed a knife in the room when he got there. Did, was that Objection. something you had brought into the room? Uh, mm. Hold on. I don't believe there was any such testimony, number one. I don't, I, I don't recall any testimony. Oh, okay. Maybe that's a mistake. Did you bring a knife in the room with you at all? No. Okay. Or did, why not? Objection relevance. I'll rule. You can answer. Thanks. Why didn't you bring a knife up there with you? Well, I didn't bring a knife up there because 
we were talking, we were spending time together. I don't see any reason for a knife at all. All right. Did you, um, uh, <coughs> how, do you know how long this conversation was going on? I never wear a watch. I, I'm bad at keeping track of time. So no, I don't. At some point, as you're having this conversation, let me ask, what's the tone of the conversation between you and Alex as you're having this conversation? In the this tone of our conversation was somber, very solemn between us. We were just, we were both pretty quiet and soft-spoken, and it was just a gentle conversation at that point. And... I think, um, did there come a time where something interrupted that conversation? Yes. All right. Um, Judge, do you want to take a lunch break now? Or? Well, I'm just kind of waiting to hear whether there's food. I'd like to go up until uh, they're ready for the jury. We, we, we don't have any word yet, so as oh. soon as we get word, okay. uh, we're going to break here real soon. All right. All right. I asked you about an interruption, and I, yes. I am, and you said there was an interruption. What, yes. what did you hear that made you realize there was a, that somebody else was there? What made me realize someone else was there is that I heard a ringtone very loudly, not far outside of the room we were in. I was like surprised by that, kind of taken back. I think I forgot to ask you this. Had you left, what had you done with your car when you had gotten over to Alex's house? I left it running. Why? I often leave my car running because it's, uh, I don't, take care of my car like I should. And there's some times when if I don't leave it running for periods of time, it will just not start again. And I also didn't really think I was gonna be there that long. Um, are you afraid because your car's running, somebody might steal it? No. Okay. It's an ugly uh, car. When you heard the ringtone, were you saying anything to the Alex about having Jason help him? No. Were you saying let him help you at all? No. Um, was Jason invited to come into the house? No, he just ah. let himself in. All right, so had you heard a knock at the door or the bell ring or anything like that? No, I didn't even know the door had opened. He just kind of burst in. Were you surprised, or let me rephrase that, what was your feeling or your emotion when you heard Jason's ringtone? I was surprised and just kind of, it shocked me. I was like, why is he just, right? why did he just let himself in? Like, what's going on? And when Jason all of a sudden shows up on the scene, yes. was there any change that you saw in Alex's demeanor? Yes. Why don't you tell us what that was? After Jason just let himself in into Alex's home, I could tell that Alex, he was no longer sitting next to me like he was. He he stood up and he was very, I call it being bristled, but he seemed on edge. What conversation took place with Jason, you, and Alex in the room? Jason kind of burst into the room and he was just using his hands a lot and he was saying, what's going on, is everybody okay? And he was talking, and I, we're, I, I kind of stepped in, and I said, everything's fine, we're fine, we're just talking. And trying to calm him down, I said, we're fine, we can talk in a public place. If Who suggested public place? Kind of all did. We came to this conclusion that we should go somewhere public. But was there something to be afraid of that was going to happen in the bedroom? No. Were you concerned about what Jason might think, that you were in Alex's bedroom? Yes. And what was that about? I knew that he'd probably jump to the conclusion, because that was our place where we talked, that he would assume that I had decided to sleep with him that day. Had you decided to sleep with Alex on that day? No. So after this conversation with Jason, and again, is, is Alex showing any other reaction or any other part of that conversation? He's, as I said, bristled. He's, he's frustrated. He's a little, um, he started to get quiet, and I always see that as a sign that Alex isn't particularly very happy. Who left the room first? Jason. After Jason left, what did you and Alex do? 
I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I guess let's, we both kind of were like, oh, I guess we should go somewhere to talk. All right. So did you and Alex leave the room? Yes. Where did you go? We went downstairs and outside. When you get downstairs and outside, what's going on? I was so confused to see that there were police vehicles there and Jason was- Did you was... call the police? No. Did, all right. At the time, did you know how the police happened to be there? No, that's why it took me by surprise so much that all of a sudden there's these two police vehicles, there's police officers. I was just like, what's, what's going on? Did the police officers come and talk to you at all? Yes, they did. Do you remember anything about their conversation? I do, yes. What do you recall? I remember they, the usual police contact. They asked for my license and my name. They asked if everything was fine and I said, yeah, we're going somewhere public to speak. Everything's fine. This is, it's, I had no concerns. How long did you talk with the police for? It wasn't very long, no. And when you were talking with the police, was there anything worrisome to you? No. After the police left, did uh, were there any words exchanged between you and Jason or Jason and Alex at all? Yes, I had said a few things to Jason. We we talked before we got in the car and left. Well, I talked to Jason before he rode off on his bike and then I got back in the car and okay. we left. I'm going to ask you some questions about what you were wearing on that day. All right. Um, what was, uh, how were you dressed that day? That day I was more layered and casual. I wasn't planning on dressing up because I had errands to run. Okay, aside from underwear, what was the first layer on top against your skin? <laughs> what was your first layer next from to your top skin? top down? So my on first, top. on top, my first layer was a yellow tiger shirt I have. Is that the t-shirt we saw on the screen before? Yes. And on top, what was the next layer that you had on? was my favorite button-up, which seems to have, it looks like dots, but they're little plants. It's a blue button-up. I hate to ask you an embarrassing question, but were you wearing underwear under your clothes that day? No. Okay. Um, and um, um, so you had no underwear on, no? All right. No. And after the blue button-up shirt, um, what did you, it, was that common for you to not wear underwear under your clothing? Yes, I had tights on, so that kind of what I thought counted it as this underwear. Uh, and a bra, is it common for you to not wear a bra? Yes. Okay. So, um, all right, let's go back. I, I want to go back to the top garment. So I think we've talked about the t-shirt, the button-up. Yes. After the button-up, what was the next thing you had on over that? The ne next thing I had on over that was my gold sweater. Okay. And is that the gold sweater we've seen the pictures of? Sometimes yes. Sometimes it looks gold, sometimes it looks brown? Yes, it looks brown, but it's it's gold. Okay. And after the gold sweater, what did you have on top of that? I had, I have this very large, it's a flannel. It's very large on me, so I kind of use it as a coat or an overcoat. Okay. Anything else on your top half of your body? Well, around my waist, I kind of had a another sweater kind of tied loosely. It's like a long sweater. Do you know what color that was? It was kind of goldish. Um, did you, all right, let's talk about the bottom half of your body. Yes. I think you mentioned tights? Yes. Were those the tights we've seen the pictures of? Yes, my knit tights. And um, on top of the tights, what did you have? I had what's been called as mom jeans, but some light wash, high-waisted pants. Okay. Okay, uh, this is, a, is this a good spot? Uh, let me just right. ask what she had on her feet and then we can okay. finish this. Okay, get through all the layers and we're good. Yeah, okay. Lunch. okay. Um, were you wearing shoes on that day? Yes, I had my work boots on. Okay, uh, that's it. Okay, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break for...